World News Today, brought to you by Admiral Corporation in behalf of distributors and dealers all over America and in many foreign lands. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations and leading news centers of our own country, CBS reporters are waiting to bring you first-hand news from the world's political and battlefronts. Now, here's Douglas Edwards. American troops have cut off the top of Cherbourg Peninsula today after smashing through to the west coast across the narrow neck of the Cape. Thousands of Germans are trapped in the area, and the great port of Cherbourg is now isolated. 1,300 American heavy bombers, a near record force, have dropped destruction on many oil refineries and storage depots in Hamburg. German flying bombs continue to land in southern England, and Berlin is shouting fanciful accounts of their devastating effect. In the Mediterranean zone, French forces are proceeding with the occupation of Elba. And on the Italian mainland, the 8th Army has reached the outskirts of Perugia, about 72 miles southeast of Florence. The Russians have reached the old Mannerheim line across the Karelian Isthmus, and at last reports are within 22 miles of Vipari. Finnish Prime Minister Ling Komis has called on the Finns to stand firm against the Soviet attack and said his nation has no course except to fight to the end. And on the island of Saipan in the Pacific, American Marines and Army troops have expanded their beachhead. And now Admiral takes you direct to the invasion beachhead in France, Larry Lasseur reporting. This is Larry Lasseur speaking from the American sector of the Normandy battlefront. Tonight, the American troops hold the entire neck of the Cherbourg Peninsula firmly in their grip. The picturesque little town of Bonneville on the western side of the peninsula has been captured, and we are now astride every road leading to Cherbourg. Thus, the big French port with its large garrison is cut off from the German army in the interior of France. Although today is D-Day for 13, the boys who are up on the front line still find themselves talking about their adventures on D-Day whenever they get a chance to smoke a cigarette. My experience is similar to that of many of the men in the 4th Division who may be assault on our beach. The 1st Division has the enviable record of being the last American division to leave Germany after the occupation of the last war, and it was chosen to be one of the first American divisions to land on the continent. It was very rough on the channel, and after hours of sea sickness, we all felt pretty gloomy. Most of us had spent the time resting in our soaking wet sand. waves had crossed over the sides of our little landing craft. But after a sleepless night, D-Day dawned. And we transferred from our barge to a tiny personnel assault craft. And with the regimental combat team, we began a rough ride into the beach. It was a fantastic sight. We could see great geysers of sand shooting up from the beachhead as our planes drenched the area with bombs in great green and yellow flashes. Every time a salvo of bombs hit the beach, our assault craft seemed to bounce back about 10 feet. We were the first regimental command post to make the landing. I don't remember waiting ashore. I think I must have just skipped in to get my feet on the ground. Every one of us felt the same way. We didn't care what happened to us, as long as we could get off that fucking bouncing boat. The din of gunfire was deafening, and the first thing I vividly remember was a little sergeant with a Brooklyn accent. He was standing on the beach, and he said to me with a grin, Boy, we made it. And of all things, he handed me a cigar. The some Germans defending the beach were being gathered in. And I remember their tall, blonde Nazi captain. Just immaculately he was, and as arrogant as ever. He refused to lie down with the rest of his men, although German shell fire was hitting the beach. And when my colleague, Bob Landry of Life Magazine, tried to take his picture, the Nazi officer turned his back on him and on the whole American landing with deepest scorn. A few minutes later, a German shell hit the beach, and a German captain went down forever. He was killed by his own shell fire. The colonel of the regiment quickly made contact with his men and led them off a feet across the green, watery waste of the part of the area in the rear. We followed him. Long, stretching lines of men, armed to the teeth. The first tank to try to cross was hit by a German anti-tank shell. The second American tank fired one shot at the German anti-tank gun and silenced it. We were on our way. In ten minutes, I had reached the position of the German gun. It was trained perfectly on the only road by which we could cross. But that first shell had panicked the German gunner, and he had fled, leaving his gun in perfect condition. I looked back at the beach from his observation post. With just that one gun, he could have held us up on that single road crossing the swamp for hours. Now I could see other German shells flashing and throwing up sand on the beach in back of it. 
and landing craft were going skyward as they hit underwater mines. But I was already in land, and I was glad I had chosen an early landing before the enemy had time to recover from the bombing, the shelling, and his surprise. The colonel kept pushing ahead, rallying his men, advancing his command post, and sending out patrols to wipe out the machine gun nests that harassed us from time to time. By mid-afternoon, Bob Landry and I were already in the little town of Saint-Marie-Dumont, some three miles in land. Here we met the parachutes. We were fighting a steep battle with the Germans. While I watched one paratrooper in hand-to-hand combat with a German, a shot rang out from a church steeple, and both the paratrooper and the German fell together, killed by a German bullet from a church. Then the paratroopers immediately turned their attention to the church steeple, tossing grenades as high as they could. And meantime, a French woman doctor refused to take cover and was giving a wounded paratrooper morphine as he lay wrapped up in his red parachute on the village green. Whenever the machine guns opened up or a grenade exploded, the French people in the town would run for cover, and as soon as it stopped, they would emerge again. It was a most confusing scene, like a Hollywood movie set. Only the dead men littering the street made it appear real. It was growing dusk by this time, and we decided to bed down on the grass for the night. Nobody had bed rolls for blankets, but we were wildly excited over the success of the second front. And then at dusk, the planes from England started to come in towing gliders. They put down in fields all around us, meeting with murderous ground fire from the Germans, who seemed to be all around us, judging by the streams of colored tracers that went up to meet the gliders. And then I talked to the soldier next to me. He was a youngster from South Carolina, and he'd been carrying a flamethrower all day long. He allowed as to how he was tired, and his leg hurt him. I rolled up his fan, and I saw a wicked shrapnel wound in his leg. He had walked all day long with it. And never complained. Those were the American soldiers on D Day. And Mr. Larry the Sir returning you now to New York. You have just heard Larry LeSeur speaking to you from the Normandy Beachhead, the sector held by American troops in France. We'll bring you more invasion news in just a moment, but now a look at the Southwest Pacific War Zone. More than fifty Mitchell bombers, escorted by a large force of lightnings, hit Sarong on the northwestern tip of Dutch New Guinea and destroyed more than 50 planes on the ground and in the air. And now we're ready to take you to London. Charles Collingwood reporting. The news from France today is the biggest since we successfully gained the beaches. As you've heard from Larry Lesseur, we have cut right across the Cherbourg Peninsula. The American 9th Division fought its way along two roads from saint Sauveur to the coast around Barnavy and Carteret. There's no mystery about what this means. It means that we have established a huge concentration camp for the German troops north of our line. We have set the stage for a German defeat which would leave the whole of the Cherbourg Peninsula in our hands. The Germans admit that we have sealed the peninsula, but they indicate that they're going to try to hold out there anyway. However, the present situation of Rommel's troops in the Cherbourg Peninsula is very similar to the position they held at the end of the Tunisian campaign. Then, as now, the Germans had their backs to the sea, with the sea as the only avenue of escape. This is a situation in which the Germans do not fight well. They did not fight well in Tunisia, and if we can hold our corridor across the Cherbourg Peninsula, there are those who think they will not fight well there. And now, here is Charles Shaw with a report about the Germans' latest secret weapon. Probably the biggest conversation piece in London today is not the invasion of northern France, but Hitler's so-called secret weapon, the pilotless plane, the robot bomber, or the soft-propelled bomb, whatever you may want to call it. But the assault is already being met. The Germans would like to know how it is being met. As far as American listeners are concerned, I can say that some of our boys are helping the British meet it, the members of the 9th Air Defense Command. And here is one member of the 9th Air Defense Command, Corporal Charles A. Dubell of Bordentown, New Jersey, who can tell you what these pilotless planes look like. How about it, Corporal Dubell? At first, I thought a regular plane was approaching, but I heard it sound like the sound of an outboard motor. And I looked up and saw a ball of yellow flame in the sky. I figured at once that it must be one of those rocket planes, because I've heard reports that the Germans were experimenting with those things. This thing came almost overhead. And then I could see it. It looked at first like a real plane, but then I realized it was too small. As it got overhead, a streak of bluish flame came out from behind it. Some folks say that these things look like spitfires, but I can't quite agree. 
there's a tube raised up on the tail, probably the projector, and that makes it look different from any other plane. Of course, it has wings on it. It has a bullet-shaped nose. It doesn't have any propeller. I'd say it's about 20 feet long with a wing sped span of about 15 feet. It looked as if it was traveling about 300 miles an hour, or maybe more, and it was flying on a straight course. Has your 9th Air Defense Command bagged any of these planes, Corporal? That's one of the things we can't talk about. Jerry will have to learn about what we're doing the hard way. Right, Corporal DeBell. I return you now to Admiral. That's the latest news on the invasion. As we began to tell you a few moments ago, about 50 Mitchell bombers escorted by a large force of fighter planes hit Sarong on the northwestern tip of Dutch New Guinea. They destroyed more than 50 planes on the ground and in the air. General Douglas MacArthur terms the enemy's last effective base in New Guinea was hit Friday in a raid by which uh, headquarters said complete tactical surprise was obtained. Most of the Jap planes were destroyed on the ground, and the lightning struck down several craft which were coming into the air. The headquarters spokesman said several enemy warships were in the harbor during the attack. Fires and explosions from burning planes and dumps covered both aerodromes. Sarong is about 660 miles from Hollandia, the recently captured aerodrome on Dutch New Guinea, and about 700 miles from Davao on Mindanao Island in the southern Philippines. And now for the latest news of the Allied progress in Italy and the French campaign, we take you to CBS Rome, Farnsworth Fowl reporting. The new Italian government under Bonomi has not yet received the benediction of the papal authorities. It's understood that Mr. Churchill is deeply dissatisfied because Marshal Bedoglio does not have a place in the new cabinet formed by the anti-fascist party. A possible solution is that Bedoglio might be given the post of foreign minister, which Bonomi is now filling in addition to his job as prime minister. Rome is full of surprises. One of them is finding an American boy, 15 years old, who's been living here right through the war. His name is Harold Pittman. His father is the American diplomatic representative to the Vatican. Under the protection of that tiny neutral state around St. Peter's, no larger than a few city blocks, Harold and his mother and younger brother watched the Germans come and go from the city of Rome, and they were on hand to welcome the American army when they arrived. When I met him yesterday, he'd just come back from seeing Sergeant York, the first American movie to be shown in Rome. Tell me, Harold, how long has it been since you've been to a show? The last one was Desert Victory. We had a private showing here. It was on September 8th. I remember because right after it ended, we heard about the Italian armistice, and that made it even more exciting. After that, the Germans came into Rome and posted guards at the entrance of the Vatican. And we couldn't go out anymore. That's funny. Haven't we been at war with the Italians before that? Yes, but they want to tell us tricks on Sunday. They let us go out and around town to the dentist and swim. Last summer, they even let us go down to the shore to go swimming twice a week. They just sent a plain clothes man along to ride in the front seat of the car. Sometimes we thought the car in the German trucks, and that made us rather nervous. You thought they might recognize you and make trouble? No, it wasn't that. We thought our own things might come over and attack them, and then we'd be in for it, too. How about the big raids on Rome? Well, we didn't have any real shelters in the Vatican City, anyway. So we used to get on the roof to walk. That first raid last July, I counted 500 of our planes. Several times we saw duels between German and American fighters. We saw a pilot go out of the P-38. It seemed to be right over the dome of St. Peter's. So then he drifted away. Another time when they were bombing the Escondo district, it was so near, it was near enough for us to see the bombs falling. But they never hit the Vatican City, did they? Always didn't. But there was one queer old plane. The Italians used to call it the Black Widow. That attacked the Vatican. Luckily, it didn't do much damage. It sounds as though you'd had a pretty exciting time of it. As a matter of fact, living in a besieged city has been daring most of the time. The Vatican authorities always did their best and were very nice to us. But there wasn't much for us to do here. My brother and I took lessons from private tutors, and we played tennis on the court that was built for Abyssinian students at the Vatican. It was fun to chat with the German sentry. Of course, he didn't know who I was. Once I went back to the store to buy a Christmas present. I might have tried it more often, but with the commotions going on between the Germans and the Italians and the fascists, it seemed a bit risky. I don't blame you. What are you going to do now that you can get around again? 
Right now, my brother and I are figuring on going home as soon as possible and entering school. We've been abroad for five years now, and that's plenty. It certainly was. Thanks, Harold, and a good trip to both of you. I return you now to New York. More news in just a moment, but first, here is Warren Sweeney with a message from Admiral Corporation. When the war is won, Admiral Corporation will unveil its new electric range, an electric range with so many revolutionary features that American homemakers will unanimously voice their approval. For instance, let's consider the six-quart complete meal cooker. This cooker will provide the finest and most economical cookery from a single vegetable to a complete meal. Suppose, for example, it's Tuesday and your regular bridge club afternoon. Haven't you often worried what sort of a dinner you can prepare quickly for Dad and the kids because you get home so late? All that will be changed when you can own an Admiral Electric Range with its complete meal cooker. You'll simply put your whole meal, meat, vegetables, and perhaps a pudding in your cooker, set the automatic timer, and go merrily on your way. You'll know that if you get home five minutes ahead of friend husband, you can have a piping hot meal ready to serve by the time he walks in the door. And the complete meal cooker is only one of the many exciting features of the Admiral Electric Range. Make a mental date now to see the after-the-war Admiral Electric Range built in the same modern factories as Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Now, here once again is Douglas Edwards. American men, planes, and ships are hammering the Japanese over a wide area of the Pacific. For a summary of this fighting, Admiral takes you now to CBS Pearl Harbor, Webley Edwards reporting. The battle for Saipan in the Marianas has progressed from the beachhead stage, and solid fighting is now going on in the interior. The United States Marines, supported by elements of an army division, consolidated original beachhead positions along the southeast corner of the island, and have captured the sugar mill town of Sharan Kanoa, roughly two miles north of Agingan Point. Two miles eastward of this point lies the main airfield of Saipan, Oslito. Our forces are now engaged in a drive for the airdrome. The fighting has been heavy, as was expected. As Admiral Nimitz said, our assumption that Saipan would be strongly held because of its strategic location in the Japanese defensive system has been proved correct. Our positions were under sustained enemy fire during the night of June 15 and 16, and before dawn on June 16, the enemy launched a determined counterattack. This attack, which was broken up, cost the enemy heavily in lives and destroyed more than 25 enemy tanks. There are, it is believed, two divisions of enemy troops defending Saipan. Using artillery and their favorite weapon, the mortar, they made the going very rough in the initial stages of the landings, and progress inward from the beaches was held up in some sectors to the point where some of our troops were withdrawn to a short distance toward the beach, while our naval forces carried out a heavy bombardment of enemy strong points. Then, with positions consolidated, our troops started driving. It was rugged going through the sugarcane fields across gullies and washes and gulches that marked the terrain, very much like those in these Hawaiian islands. This is Wubbly Edwards at the Pearl Harbor. I return you to Admiral in New York. Now for an interview with a former managing editor of The New Yorker who witnessed the preparation of our giant B-29s for their first attack on Japan, Admiral takes you to CBS Washington, Don Pryor reporting. The most sensational news of the week, of course, was the bombing of Japan by B-29s based in China. So I'd like to have you meet a man who just got back to Washington after 16 months in the China-India-Burma theater where he watched the preparations for that historic operation. He's Major St. Clair McElway, former managing, managing editor of the New Yorker magazine and recently public relations officer on the staff of Major General George E. Stratemeyer, senior American air officer in the Asiatic Theater. Major McElway, what's the story behind the story that broke this week over Japan? Well, about all I can give you is the reaction of a reporter who was there and who saw the job being done. I didn't have any direct part in the B-29 program, except as a publicity man working in reverse, trying to keep the story from getting out prematurely. Well, I should think that would have been rather difficult in itself. After all, you can't hide a B-29 in a briefcase. No, and yet I believe we actually took the Japs by surprise last Thursday. They've been hinting that they knew what we were up to out there for quite a while. 
but I think they were just fishing around for information. I'm quite sure they didn't know we would be ready to hit them so soon and with a full-size striking force. So the secret must have been fairly well kept, even though thousands of people in India and China knew about it. And the answer, I think, is that the officers and men who knew the story were so thoroughly impressed with the importance of the B-29 that they just wouldn't talk. I don't know of a single case of an officer or a GI giving away a bit of information. It was their own big secret, and they were very proud of it. They knew that this was the plane that was actually going to hit Japan, and every man felt that he had something to do with getting it over the target. Well, when did you first see the B-29 out there? Just a couple of months ago. Well, what effect did it have, I mean, psychologically? Well, it was like a shot in the arm. A British officer I knew was sitting on the lawn of his home with his four-year-old daughter when a B-29 came in from the west rather low. The little girl pointed and said, Daddy, just look at that big damn thing. That's how most people felt about it. When the first plane landed on a specially built runway in eastern India, a bunch of officers and men were grouped around watching. Everyone was silent until finally a GI mechanic expressed what all of us were thinking. Now, he said, we're getting somewhere. That wonderful airplane gave a lift to everybody in the theater, even to Stillwell's troops fighting in the Burma jungles. Well, just, uh, just how could it have an effect on them? Well, because they knew that the farther south they pushed the Japs in Burma, the easier it would be for the transport planes to fly into China from India, and the more gasoline they could carry to the B-29s. That plane, with its promise of a direct and solid punch against Japan, brought a new incentive to everybody out there. Everybody, GIs and officers, worked 10 and 15 hours a day voluntarily and under the worst kind of hardships because they knew that every minute they saved would bring the B-29 that much nearer, nearer their target. General Stratemeyer expressed the feeling very simply. If the B-29 boys say we helped them do that job, he said, that's all any of us can ask for. And did you find the same reaction in China at General Wolf's advance bases? Well, I can't speak Chinese, but I watched hundreds of thousands of Chinese farmers building those fields literally by hand. And I know they did a magnificent job in an incredibly short time. Well, how about the B-29 men themselves? Well, they don't want anybody to think they're doing a stunt. Just before I left, I had a talk with General Blondie Saunders, who was the ranking officer on the raid last Thursday. This is what he told me. With this Air Force, we're not after the man or the machine. We're after the tools and the materials the man uses to make the machine. That's real strategic bombing on the classic model, and they're completely serious about their mission and about the ability of their plan to shorten this war. Well, I think I can vouch for the fact that all the people here are behind them. Like the G.I. said, now we're getting someplace. I return you to Admiral in New York. Now, once again, here is Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral. Before the war, the personal or camera-type radio was becoming very popular. The Admiral Bantam, compact and light in weight, was small enough to be packed away in luggage or could be conveniently carried without being burdensome. The Admiral Bantam's popularity was largely due to its excellent tonal quality and sufficient volume, and there were never any power blackouts with the Bantam, for it operated equally well on self-contained batteries or on alternating or direct house currents. No doubt you wanted an Admiral Bantam until Pearl Harbor made their manufacture impossible. When the war is won, the Admiral Bantam will be back at its place of leadership along with the other members of the Admiral Radio family, the console types, the table models, and, of course, the Admiral Radio phonograph models with automatic record changers. Admiral, you know, was the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonographs with automatic record changers, all of the research and development in connection with Admiral's 100% war production has brought many improvements and refinements. All these will be included in the grand array of Admiral radios to be offered in the immediate post-war period. All fuel for home heating will be scarce next winter. For your own protection, each of you should do everything you can to get your home ready for cold weather now. Stock up on all the fuel your dealer can let you have and check your heating equipment to make it as efficient as possible. This is the time to prepare for winter. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Admiral Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set, 
and post-war makers of Admiral Refrigerators, Admiral Home Freezers, Admiral Electric Ranges. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from leading news centers of the world. This is...